Thank you very much, Shelley, and thanks, everyone. It's great to be here with you today. I was planning to make a few jokes, but thankfully, Alexi has covered that, so I can keep it bland. Um, I'll just start by saying greetings and, and solidarity to you all. Um, I think when we're thinking about the future, I think it's important to reiterate some of the points that we've heard today uh, and, and remember why we are here today in this hall. Um, and we're here to commemorate two things. The first is 20 years of brutal and catastrophic wars waged by the West in pursuit of global dominance. 20 years of the occupation of Afghanistan, of over 300,000 bombs dropped, at least 70,000 civilians killed, and millions displaced didn't uh, get rid of the Taliban, it didn't bring democracy, it didn't protect women. The occupation of Iraq, which left a million people dead, the bombardment of Libya, which killed at least 30,000 people, and has created a lawless state where now in 2021 there is an actual human slave trade. These wars and those in Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Pakistan, all have one thing in common, and that is that they have been utter failures. Today, those countries have been absolutely devastated and the terrorism has spread. New and worse terrorist groups have emerged, like ISIS, and have been able to recruit primarily because of the growing anti-Western sentiment as a result of these wars. As we saw with the Arab Spring 10 years ago and with Afghanistan now, the biggest inhibitor to the peoples of these countries being able to determine their future and create democracy has been Western intervention. Now the second thing we're commemorating is 20 years of the anti-war movement, 20 years of resisting these wars at every step. We know the impact that we have had in shaping public opinion, in creating a permanent campaigning force that continues to resonate with millions of people across the country, and in limiting the ability of our rulers to launch the kinds of wars and occupations that they did in Afghanistan and Iraq. We know that today there is the highest level of public support for Palestine in Britain, anywhere in the West, because, because in 2003, when we marched two million people against the Iraq war, our banner said, don't attack Iraq, freedom for Palestine. Because we mobilized en masse when Gaza was under attack, and because we have staunchly been principled in our opposition to apartheid and occupation. This year alone, we saw three of the biggest mobilizations for Palestine, and we know that they were of central importance in causing Israel uh, to call a ceasefire and in showing the Palestinian resistance that they had popular international support. And of course, as has been said, we have we've been absolutely right to put campaigning against Islamophobia and against the demonization of refugees uh, front and center of our movement. Uh, and you can look at France, for example, uh, to see what happens when you don't. We were right to campaign against the attacks on civil liberties, the Islamophobic prevent agenda, which Loki talked about in such detail, Guantanamo Bay, which still remains open, and the rendition flight. These are all products of the war on terror. And there is a direct authoritarian trajectory between those and the continued erosion of our rights that we see today. The Investigatory Powers Act, the Spy Cops Bill, the Overseas Operations Act, the jailing of whistleblowers like Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, the Police and Crime Bill, which is just going through Parliament right now, uh, and the two-tier citizenship that the Tories have de facto created with their treatment of Shamima Begum. So we have to make this the biggest possible, we bloody told you so, moment that we possibly can. <laughs> because we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind the politicians, and importantly, we need to remind the population at large that we were right that the people were right and our rulers were wrong. And yet, our politicians, present company excluded, have learned absolutely nothing. They lament the end of the war in Afghanistan. They cry crocodile tears for the women who are now living under Taliban rule, who for the last 20 years they've been bombing. The Tories have this year increased defense spending by 16.5 billion pounds while claiming that there's no money for a pay rise for nurses, or to maintain the uplift to universal credit, <laughs> or to not raise national insurance for the poorest workers, so that they can increase our nuclear arsenal by 40%, so that they can send their military flotilla to the South China Sea, so that they can continue airstrikes in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. And that's why it's so important that there is going to be an anti-war block on the People's Assembly demonstration in two weeks' time in Manchester, 
because, yeah, <laughs> because the arguments against war and austerity are completely intertwined and we need to bring together all the different strands of opposition. <laughs> so I hope that that applause means you'll all be in Manchester and if you're not planning to already, there's some leaflets at the back, please get down there. Um, and this moment uh, of defeat hasn't been a wake-up call for the political class to admit that they were wrong, but rather the decline of Western imperialism is a moment for them to seek new arenas of warfare, to attempt to maintain their waning hegemony. And we can see this with the ramping up of tensions uh, and the encircling of China. So we have to be the ones to remind them how wrong they were and are. And we can never allow people to believe that these corrupt warmongers know better than us, that there is anything benevolent about their aims, or that, that, that we are powerless to stop them. We know what a threat we are because we saw the extent that they went to smear Jeremy Corbyn and our movement because we stood against their imperialism. <laughs> the threat of more war continues. The danger of increasing militarism continues. The worsening reality of occupation, apartheid, and siege in Palestine continues. The, the, the mass murder, the drowning of refugees, the Islamophobia and racism on our streets all continue. The mass polluting by our militaries continues, but so must our movement. If there's one lesson that we must learn from the last 20 years, it is that we have the power. Our strength is in our solidarity and our principles, and if anything, we need to build a stronger, more determined, more organized movement now more than ever. The mobilization against the Iraq war didn't come from nowhere. It came from a whole year of public meetings and marches up and down the country. And that's what we need to get back to. We need to have local groups in every town and city. We need to be putting on these public meetings. We need to be demonstrating. We need to stay on the streets, not least because every protest we have now is a defiance against their bill to clamp down on our right to protest. And, sorry, I'm wrapping up. And, um, <clears throat> I lost where I was. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we need to bring back, you know, school students and trade unions back into our movement in a big way. So I'll leave with this to just say that we have a fight on our hands. We know we were right. We know we have the power. So we need to keep fighting. We need to keep building, and together we can win. Solidarity. Solidarity.